and we've got a few speakers here which we're very uh, lucky to have, uh, the first of which I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, Professor Bill Blaney, the uh, Dean of our School of Education and the Arts uh, here at CQU. So over to you, Bill. Thank you, Ben. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here, everybody. So before we start, I'd like to, in the spirit of reconciliation, expect, respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting is taking place all across this great country of ours. We pay our respects to the First Nations people and their elders, past, present and future, for how the memories, traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. Look, thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. When Ben first asked me, I was a bit humbled by the whole process because I've been selling it. We're going to have a launch when you finish that bloody book, Bren, and we're going to be doing it today in a different format because it was pre-COVID in those days. But let's just do a bit of a summary about what the book's all about. The term post-truth was basically an Oxford Dictionary word of the year in 2016. Had a spike of usage with the election of Donald Trump, which is very close today. It's very, it's 48 to 46 at the moment. I just checked about half an hour ago. So Biden may still get there after all. Um, also the Brexit referendum in the UK was also a part of this process at the same time. Although it is now a common term in political discourse, it's the first book to define post-truth history and to specifically consider the implications of post-truth world in the study of history in academia. The post-truth means an environment where personal belief and emotion is more influential than the facts and expert opinion. This book investigates both theoretical dimensions and specific case studies. It argues ramifications of post-truth are deeply significant to the study of history across Australia and beyond. A post-truth environment presents particular problems to historians who are trained to deal with the evidence, data and facts. This book asks difficult questions such as does the historian have a role to play in preserving public memory? from alternative facts or fake news, as Donald would say, to academics more generally have an obligation to combat fake news in both universities and the social media. My answer to that is definitely yes, please continue to do so. This book strongly aligns with the School of Education and the Arts Research Strengths in the area of humanities and social and critical inquiry. It tackles one of the significant paradigm shifts in public discourse this century and challenges historians to be proactive in combating post-truth history. At times, the book is a call to arms as the survey of, in chapter 15 shows, most academics do feel they have obligation to be an, an activist also and to defend the intellectual rigour and honesty that is fundamental to the mission of all universities throughout the world. This book highlights CQ's mission to be a global outward looking university and includes chapters from academics working in Europe, Africa, Asia, North America and Australia. Wide ranging books with diverse case studies including museums and heritage in Mexico, stolen generations in Australia, Holocaust in Ireland, the United States, and a new enthusiasm for Hitler in the strangest place of all, India, encouraged by disinformation in school textbooks. I would like to particularly thank Ben for all the work he's done and his team on this book and congratulations on your launch. And now I'm gonna hand back to Ben. Thank you all very much for coming today. My, my great pleasure to be here once again. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Bill, for your uh, kind words. And, uh, and it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Frank Bongiorno to officially launch the book. Uh, Frank needs little introduction to anyone involved in history uh, in Australia, and I won't intrude on his time by uh, listing his very lengthy resume of achievements. Uh, uh, suffice to say, he's the uh, head of history at the ANU and uh, vice president of the Australian Historical Association. And uh, over to you, Frank. Um, thanks so much, Ben, and thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and the Gambri peoples on whose land I'm speaking today. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, well, look, thank you, Ben, for the invitation to launch the book tonight. Um, I thought it best to hold off writing this speech until fairly late last night, actually, and perhaps in slightly different circumstances, it might have begun as follows. Um, American electors' overwhelming repudiation of Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential election is the greatest blow to post the post-truth world that we've seen for many years. Until 2020, many Americans seemed perfectly content to inhabit the parallel universe or fictional world that Donald Trump had created for them. It was not that they believed his lies or approved of behaviour that many would find intolerable in a neighbour, a friend or a family member. It was that they didn't care. 
they were indifferent to whether he told the truth or not. But then COVID-19 arrived and over 200,000 people in the United States lost their lives. His remedies included detergent and sunlight. Black, Black Lives Matter came along too. Tear gas, batons, boots. Um, and even when initiated or cheered on by the president, um, a, a good idea, a big idea couldn't be defeated. You take these together and you add the worst recession for generations and Trump and his supporters were presented with a reality that could no longer be denied. You can't argue with a virus. You can't argue you've been the greatest friend to African-Americans since Abraham Lincoln when you praise those who hate them or even kill them. You can't declare that your management of the economy has been a roaring success when there are millions filing for unemployment benefits. Trump, I might have said, was finally, finally mugged by reality. And so were millions of voters. Sure, there'd still be a minority who believe that the liberal elite are running a pedophile ring from a Washington pizza joint, just as there are probably people who think they recently saw Elvis in a Memphis Walmart. But their influence will likely wane. America, divided and damaged as it is by the most mendacious, corrupt, an incompetent president in its history can perhaps still bounce back. This election result was a landslide in favour of decency, common sense, and above all else, truth. Now, that speech, of course, won't do tonight. Um, instead, as I doom scrolled Twitter from time to time yesterday, reading the opinions of those who were epidemiologists last week, pathologists this week, and no doubt will be constitutional lawyers by tomorrow, I kept thinking of something I'd read in an article by Guy Rundle in Crikey just a few days ago. He wrote, both sides, reason versus conspiracy, offer complementary forms of secular Gnosticism, the claim to a secret knowledge that places one among the elect. Progressives wonder at the persistence and spread of conspiratorial thinking. But if reason has been turned against you, if its main effect is to undermine your life world, what is rational about committing to reason? Now, as disturbing as such an argument might be to those of us who live our lives in and around universities, books and ideas, there seems to be something in what Rundle is saying. Adam Shimaleski has some similar things to say in his chapter uh, in, in, in this wonderful book, on post-truth and consequences. We might suspect that the abandonment of reason and the embrace of conspiratorial thinking is a road to the gulag and the gas chamber, that a president who claims victory when he hasn't won is a dictator in the making. But there are millions of us who don't see the world this way, and they have no respect for historical or indeed any other kind of knowledge that might suggest otherwise. That's why this excellent book is both timely and important. Its contributors aren't a choir, they don't agree on everything, but they do, I think, agree on one thing, that post-truth is not just a lie or deception. They all take the view that further conditions must be met. They suggest that the term appears to have been coined in 1992, and that the credit probably belongs to Steve Kessich, writing in The Nation. So I looked up today and found was also the screenwriter of a film uh, that I much admire from the, uh, the late 1970s, Breaking Away. Now, Marius and Benjamin quote him in their introductory chapter, and this is what he had to say about post-truth. We are rapidly becoming prototypes of a people that totalitarian monsters would only drool about in their dreams. All the dictators up to now have had to work hard at suppressing the truth. We, by our actions, are saying that this is no longer necessary, that we've acquired a spiritual mechanism that can denude truth of any significance. In a very fundamental way, we, as a free people, have freely decided that we want to live in some post-truth world. Now, that strikes me as a fair summation of where much of the world is now, whatever it's um, application for 1992, or it's at least where some of our leaders would like to take us if they could. The United States, frankly, looks pretty far gone. 
empires come and go, and its best days now look to be some way behind it. But that's present politics. What of present history? Post-truth history, our editors suggest, is characterised by indifference to historicity, the appeal to emotion and or personal belief, and ideological motivation. It's this combination, which also includes a contempt for expert opinion, that gives post-truth history its identity, its meaning. For the philosopher Mazarin Pagnol, uh, quoted in this collection, post-truth is not the lie, but indifference to the distinction between the lie and the truth. It's a helpful definition, I think, but it's also a perplexing one for a historian. We can all agree that history that prefers emotion or belief to evidence, to rationality, is deeply problematic. But that still begs the question, doesn't it? What is the role for emotion in history? We all know it's a part of what we do, as it should be. We also know that many of the impulses behind the new, new histories that opened up in the 1960s included an emotional connection with the lives of the oppressed in the present. Can we, should we, write of the most intense human injustice and suffering in history without emotion, without affect? How can we reach an audience if we're talking about slavery or the Holocaust or the victims of oppression and violence in any time and place, unless we exercise both our own empathy and try to cultivate the empathy of others. We can't literally feel the pain of our subjects, but part of the power of history comes from its capacity to bring us out of ourselves. And that is about the, the emotions, as well as being about reason. The authors of the chapter, Museums and Critical Spaces for Alterity in a Post-Truth World, Andrea Gallardo Ocampo and Miguel uh, Iachi Apa, make the point well. The museum, they suggest, should arouse compassion for the suffering of others. I accept that post-truth history may well be characterised by a preference for emotion over reason, and that's problematic. But I still wonder what role there might be for emotion in a discipline and a practice that we know dies in the hands of the mere fact grubber. It would be post-truth history's triumph, surely, if it managed to kill our discipline by embarrassing us into abandoning feeling, emotion, and their effect entirely. But post-truth history, of course, is much more than emotion. It's a fundamentally ideological practice intended to leg legitimize the state and to bolster the power of individuals, groups, and classes within it at the expense of others. It's the impulse that prompts the Polish government, as we learn in the book, to criminalise the suggestion of Polish complicity in the Holocaust. It's the impulse that leads journalist Andrew Bolt to deny the existence of the stolen generations, as Benjamin Jones explained in his chapter. It's the impulse behind the effort in Argentina, explored here by Daniel Feierstein, to allow people to live comfortably without having to face up to the atrocities committed in the past, in that case in the 70s and early 80s. Post-truth history is endlessly creative in turning perpetrators into victims or in equating radically uneven struggles between the state and insurgents into a, a pox on both your houses. How pleasant it is to live above the poxy house, convinced of one's moral superiority as a neutral, to declare that neither side is any good, or as Donald Trump assured us, that there are fine people on both sides even when, when one side comprises racists. Feinstein calls the pox on both your houses in the Argentinian context, the theory of the two demons in relation to the era of the dictatorship. But there's certainly nothing specifically Argentinian about the habit. It's there, for instance, in Andre Brett's chapter on the um, Moriori, the indigenous people of Chatham Islands or Waricari. According to one long-standing myth, these people were the original inhabitants of New Zealand, Melanesians who were defeated and displaced by the Polynesian, Polynesian Maori. It has been a politically useful myth in settler New Zealand, one used 
as uh, a kind of exculpatory uh, discourse by some settlers and as a way of denying the indigeneity of the Māori. It seems to say, if we are demons, if we settlers are demons, we are not alone in that, for the Māori were also settlers who acted as we did before we came here and displaced them. So the world goes. In reality, a group of Māori did invade and enslave the Moriori uh, on their own islands in the mid 1830s. And this affair has been taken up and the facts manipulated by the alt-right internationally to underline the dangers of um, that people's peaceable dealings with the world. You know, it operates as a kind of parable. You know, don't be too peaceable, you'll be enslaved, you'll be taken over. Several of the chapters, those by Gerald Starnica on anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, by Alana Piper and Anna Stevenson, Feminist History, by Benjamin Mercer on the uh, uh, Trump uh, fascist analogy, and June Bam Hutchison on the erasures in South African historiography, emphasise continuity more than disjuncture. If we're living in an era of post-truth history, they suggest, it began a very long time ago. Piper and Stevenson point out there's nothing new about incredulity toward the findings of feminist scholarship. Mercer underlines the venerable lineage of viewing the present in relation to Weimar and Nazi Germany. Indeed, he wonders whether post-truth is actually a helpful framework at all for regarding Donald Trump. Was he not defeated by Silvio Berlusconi, another mendacious, misogynistic, and racist media magnate turned politician? It would perhaps be a more interesting question to ask why Italy of all places, for good or ill, often ill, seems to have been so often the frontier of political modernity over the last century. As a historian of Australia, there was much in this book I found provocative, beyond the chapter that specifically deals um, with our own local version of denialism that by Ben um, Jones. The parallels with South Africa in uh, Bam Hutchison's chapter, in part a case study of the Simonstown Museum, seem especially striking. Indeed, it provoked a question I don't think I've ever articulated before. Why in my year nine geography class, uh, sorry, year seven geography class, I should say, back in 1981, did we study the Bushmen of the Kalahari and not the indigenous people of Australia? Indeed, why was there nothing, so far as I can recall, on Aboriginal history or society until a couple of brief excursions into that field in year 11 English? And history. It's not that our teachers were shy about race. We had a splendid full year course on African American history in year 10. Was there an evasion going on here too in Melbourne, Australia, of the early 1980s? Ben Hutchison's provocative argument is that post 1994 reconciliation politics in South Africa has given rise to, I quote, a deliberate and conscious denial and manipulation of truth. Post-truth constituting historical erasure or euphemism concerning slavery, genocide, and indeed even the indigenous presence on the land has become the dominant historical paradigm. Its purpose, it's suggested, is to avoid offending white South Africans. Asabi Khan Banerjee and George Stauber refer similarly to the saffronization, a word I love now, saffronization of Indian history and the Indian history curriculum in the interests of Hindu nationalist elites. We don't need to look very hard in our own Australian historiography, museums and media to find plenty of the same. Ben Mercer um, reports on a landmark German exhibition, Crimes of the Wehrmacht, as having sparked public debate in Germany, despite the controversies around, uh, swirling around it. But try a mental exercise. Change the title to Crimes of the Anzacs or Crimes of the Pioneers and move the scene from Germany and Austria, where that uh, particular exhibition toured, to Australia. Can you imagine either of those exhibitions finding a place in the museum, uh, museum space of Canberra or indeed perhaps any other major city in Australia? I can't. In our case, at least, Post-truth may be less a phenomenon of the modern condition than the denialism necessary to allow white Australians to live with the easy consciences that we value above all else. So congratulations to the editors, Marius Guidonis and Benjamin Jones, and to all of the authors, and especially, of course, those 
who are here tonight on this marvellous book. Your timing is impeccable. Um, the issues that it deals with are indeed among the most urgent that we now face. So I declare history in a post-truth world, theory and praxis duly launched. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Frank, for those very kind words and also uh, that rich and thoughtful uh, commentary on our chapters. And uh, just a reminder to any uh, of the attendees out here uh, that if anything um, sparks your interest that you want to uh, write a question about, just put that in the Q&A and uh, we, will, uh, we will get to those uh, shortly. Uh, so thanks again, uh, Frank, not only uh, for your words just now, but also your uh, support and friendship over many years. And thank you, everyone who's joined us uh, here. And uh, most of all, I really need to acknowledge a colleague and friend who unfortunately is not here, and that's uh, Marius uh, Godonis. And uh, he's a brilliant scholar with uh, degrees from Oxford and Sabon, and uh, soon to be a another one from Collegium Civitas. Uh, he's an expert on the uh, Yedwabna uh, pogrom, and uh, th the book just wouldn't be possible without him. His first-rate editing improved every chapter, and uh, he's also a polyglot, uh, and he translated chapters from Spanish and Polish. Uh, he's the one who was responsible for securing Henri Rousseau to write the foreword, and, uh, and he also translated that from French. And uh, there are many hurdles along the way, as anyone who's produced an edited collection will understand. Uh, but I'm very grateful to have uh, worked uh, with Marius. So thank you and uh, Jean Curia. I've learned a great deal in the process of putting this book together and I'm so grateful to the contributors. We've got a fantastic cohort of academics uh, working in South Africa and India, Australia, Mexico, Argentina, the United States, France, Poland, and Germany. So a truly international collaboration. And uh, I bought myself a nice bottle of uh, Clonakilla to, uh, uh, to celebrate. And of course, I left it at home. So I'll enjoy that when I get home. And I madly looked around my office for anything I could toast and the only thing I have is this 1984 uh, commemorative port uh, from the Labour Party. So, um, so I raise a hawkey to, uh, to all my fellow authors. Uh, the book is timely, I think, and uh, it's an exploration not only of theoretical dimensions and case studies, but it deliberately has praxis in the title because we do hope there's something of a call to arms in it for those who do not welcome a post-truth world. And particularly for historians, I think there can be a great deal of frustration thinking that if people only knew the facts about a historical event, then they would change their mind. And I think we often get caught in this web of thinking if we just present the facts and the evidence in our books and in our articles, uh, that, or, or if we show links to reputable sources online that we can combat this, but I think a lot of that approach has the assumption that post-truth world is the same as a lie or propaganda or pseudo history. And in those cases, the purveyor of information is somehow trying to trick the recipient into believing something that is false. But the pernicious nature of post-truth history is that it represents something closer to a conversation where both the purveyor and the recipient of historical misinformation want to believe something that can't be substantiated for ideological reasons. So there's an indifference to truth and the indifference is what I think causes a lot of problems. And just to say a couple of quick comments on my chapter, it's about denialism of the stolen generations. And what really strikes me is the way downplayers and deniers have this symbiotic relationship and specifically, I was struck, how could someone with such a high profile as Andrew Bolt just claim outright not a single Aboriginal child was removed for racist reasons, uh, only ever for genuine reasons of protection? How can he get away with that, with the mountain of evidence 
uh, not least the direct personal testimony from living survivors in the public domain. And what I conclude is twofold. Firstly, uh, there is this relationship where downplayers pave the way for deniers. So immediately after the Bringing Them Home report was tabled in Parliament, there was this fierce opposition uh, about even the term generation that implies the numbers were too big and the numbers were scrutinised. Erica Betts actually suggested in Parliament maybe all 500 witnesses had not been honest in what they reported. Uh, Paddy McGuinness asked in Quadrant, maybe they all had a collective false memory syndrome, uh, a condition that doesn't actually exist, incidentally. It was something that uh, Holocaust deniers sometimes say about Holocaust survivors. And, um, and of course, Keith Windshuttle has a whole book downplaying the severity. And it, it seems to me that this is really where the battle of ideas takes place, because once someone has gone down this dark path of denialism, and the post-truth mindset sets in, I think it's almost impossible to pull them out again. But on a more positive note, Marius in his fascinating survey, uh, in his chapter, he points out that academics generally believe they should take part in public debate and they should call out post-truth history. And indeed, we uh, possibly have a duty beyond teaching and writing to use our expertise uh, for the public good. And I think there can be very few causes more worthy than this because post-truth history, I think, can too easily be a forerunner for real world violence. And uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll end. Um, and I'd just like to invite um, uh, some of our uh, authors to uh, speak briefly about their chapters also. And um, first, if uh, Andre's out there, um, if you'd like to talk about your chapter, uh, we'd be delighted to hear about it. Cool. Thank you, Ben. Um, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato katoa. Um, it's fantastic to be part of this launch. And uh, when Ben invited me to contribute a chapter to this collection, uh, I was thrilled to take it as an opportunity to return to my research on the history of the Moriori people of Rakohu, um, the Chatham Islands off the eastern coast of New Zealand. Um, Frank's already said a bit about this, that they are a, um, you know, a related but separate people to Maori in mainland New Zealand. Uh, and uh, the members of two migrating Maori groups in 1835 enslaved and almost exterminated the entire Moriori population. Now, um, Moriori practiced traditions of nonviolence uh, and maintained those in the face of such a calamitous event. Um, and so my earlier research had located these um, within, um, look at, located these events within a wider South Pacific and imperial context and sought to deepen the conceptualization of colonial genocide. Um, so this time, I decided to think a bit differently about Moriori history and to connect it with developments and attitudes in the present. Um, and so to a large extent, this chapter really reflects how I became interested in Moriori history in the first place as a New Zealander and a member of the Kiwi diaspora in Australia. Um, there are a number of myths uh, that circulate in New Zealand about Moriori. Um, that draw on, they, they're rooted in racial ideas that were fashionable in the 19th century uh, and use purportedly historical claims that have long since been proven false. Uh, and uh, as, as Frank said, basically in a nutshell, the myths describe as the indigenous inhabitants of mainland New Zealand uh, and claim that invading Maori killed and cannibalised uh, most of the Moriori, uh, with only a handful of them fleeing to the Kohu. Uh, there's no factual basis for this claim, uh, yet as a friend of mine uh, has put it, uh, the longer New Zealand political discussion goes, the probability of somebody saying, but Maori ate Moriori approaches one to one. It's a pernicious attempt to present Maori as colonisers akin to the British, 
and I cite some examples of this in the chapter. Uh, and I hope you, you might read it and keep an eye out uh, for the outlandish one of the woman who posed nude on the sacred peak of Mount Taranaki and responded to critics by denying Maori indigeneity. It is uh, quite the tale. So these myths about Moriori continue to circulate in New Zealand and often with the allure of some sort of special knowledge. Uh, and fortunately, the influence is waning domestically. Um, but the problem is that these myths have taken on a new life in the alt-right internationally. Moriori history was almost unknown outside of New Zealand until Jared Diamond published Guns, Germs and Steel in 97. He presented an incurious and deterministic account of Moriori that suggested their, their Pacific traditions doomed them. Alt-right commentators appropriated this as a cudgel with which to beat those who oppose war and to boost the idea that Western civilization must be militaristic. All of them misunderstand Moriori traditions and use Moriori history in political contexts thoroughly unrelated to Rakohu. The continued dissemination of myths about Moriori, therefore, shows how bad faith actors readily abuse historical facts. And I emphasize in my chapter that it's important that we consider what the myth offers the user. Whatever the context, the factual accuracy of these myths about Moriori matters far less than its value for promoting colonialism in the domestic context or white supremacy in the international one. This shows us that although fact checking is valuable, it is by no means sufficient alone. So uh, I would like to end uh, by thanking both Ben and Marius uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to be involved in this volume. Uh, they've been ideal editors, really, uh, engaged and thoughtful throughout, uh, and their comments on my drafts were of great use. Uh, especially I hope accessible for international audience as well as New Zealanders. Uh, so to Ben and Marius, uh, thank you and cheers and Nanihi Nui. Thanks so much, Andre. And uh, we actually had a, uh, Andre produced this uh, chapter in about a month or something um, incredible like that. Uh, so I was uh, so impressed um, with that quick turnaround. And uh, uh, Ben Mercer, uh, we'd love to hear about your. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much, Ben. And I'd also like to thank Ben and Marius for their invitation to contribute to the book. And also I think for sort of accepting something that they probably weren't expecting when they asked me uh, to write a chapter. So my chapter concerns uh, Donald Trump and therefore I've really run the, the risk of what I've written being out of date by the following day um, or the latest tweet. Um, and this is something now written over a year ago. I, I, I think it has held up reasonably well, um, but I'll leave that to, to readers. Um, I guess I'm particularly interested in the debate amongst historians which emerged after 2016 and Trump's election over whether Trump is a fascist. Um, and with two goals in mind, one of trying to place the phenomenon of post-truth and its relation to historical truth in a longer context. And secondly, placing that discussion of Trump as a fascist in a longer context of other rhetorical and political invocations of the fascist past. So the first goal of placing truth and post-truth in a, in a longer context, I think historians of uh, 20th century Europe, of Germany, Nazi Germany, the fascist era, the Holocaust, have long been familiar with problems of the political uses of the past, of the tendentious deployment of historical analogies, the vexed question of historical truth, and above all of the audience that exists for historical untruths. Um, there are many examples of this, and Frank's already given a couple. The historian's dispute of the 1980s in Germany demonstrated, I think, the appeal of a history in which Germans were victims of the Second World War. Uh, the crimes of the Wehrmacht ex exhibition in the 1990s uh, became controversial for challenging broadly accepted myths of a clean Wehrmacht during the Second World War. And these instances of debates about the memory of the past uh, related to Nazism and the Holocaust demonstrates, I think, that there has always been an audience for versions of the past that don't conform 
to historical research or truth. There's a long history of resistance to knowledge, to truth, especially where this comes into conflict with existing modes of meaning. And it cautions us, I think, of any diagnosis of a sudden turn to fake history in a post-truth society. And therefore, I guess, returning to Trump, I'm careful not to overemphasize the importance of Trump to mark a new era of post-truth politics. Um, and I'd point out that things like post-truth and truthiness are coined at least in the era of George W. Bush and the war on terror, if not before. And there are certainly precedents for Trump's mendacity, his ostentatious disregard for reality, his racism, his misogyny, uh, and his politics more generally. And Frank's already uh, mentioned Silvio Berlusconi as a prototype. Um, and to answer your question, Frank, there's of course many reasons why Italy is a precursor to this sort of thing. Um, but one key reason I think is the collapse of the political spectrum uh, after the Cold War. Um, there are other contingent reasons which have to do with Italian politics, but I think it means that Italy opens up space for somebody like uh, Berlusconi or Trump much earlier than other polities after the end of the Cold War. So I think that the advent of Trump in 2016 crystallizes an audience for post-truth as an explanation for his victory, but I'm cautious about seeing it as particularly novel. Um, and here I come to sort of the, the second related aspect of my chapter, which is the use of fascism and the invocation of fascism to understand Trump. And I come to this as a historian of the 1960s um, and someone who's traced the use of the rhetoric of fascism in the 1960s at a point at which it at some point almost lost any his analytical or historical uh, meaning. And this too, I think, makes me cautious about its current deployment. Now, while it's, I think, um, undoubtedly obvious that Trump is utterly unconcerned with democracy and that his instincts, such as they exist, are authoritarian, illiberal and undemocratic, the deployment of the fascist analogy in relation to Trump, I argue, has created a genre of history which itself is ambiguous in its historical foundations. And it's very striking to see that analogies from European history in particular are being used to understand US politics. And the use of the rhetoric of fascism has created a sort of new genre of history as warning in which the 1930s are very vaguely invoked uh, as a period of important lessons for the present. All too frequently, I would argue this is, this history of warning is not history as understanding. It's not particularly self-reflexive. It's often uh, predictive, uh, trying to understand where the present is going rather than helping to understand the present and all too often offers simplistic lessons for other people. And they're not always wrong. They're things like beware the one party state seems to be a favorite lesson of people discussing fascism. But um, one question is who really needs to be told that? Um, and they don't really reflect historical analysis, but the use of the past to evoke, to alarm and to warn. So there seems, I think there is a very, it's very evident there's an enormous appetite for fake history but that there always was, and it's not going to be resolved by the genre of history as warning. Uh, the question we need to be concerned with is less to correct fake history, because as Andre has just mentioned, giving the facts and the evidence doesn't really work very frequently, but to understand how the audience for fake history and for post-truths has become so large in the first place. That's my chapter, thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. And, um, and Anna and Alana, I, I should say, also like Andre, um, uh, joined our project late in the piece and I'm so grateful that they uh, produced such an outstanding uh, chapter in such a uh, quick period. So uh, thank you and um, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, Anna, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much for the introduction, Ben. I'd just like to say I'm joining those who are having wine by a, with a cheese platter that my partner prepared. So in the spirit of a good book launch. Um, yeah, thank you also to Ben and Marius for their very generous uh, invitation for us to join this collection. Um, I was privileged to speak on behalf of Alana and myself and myself last year at Central Queensland University, which is my alma mater, about our book, Gender Violence in Australia. And um, 
very grateful for Ben's help in organizing that presentation, but afterwards he also extended the um, generous invitation for us to contribute to this collection. So we were very, we were thrilled to um, have this opportunity. I'd just like to start with a bit of an anecdote in which I've encountered situations recently in which students have found themselves to be questioning the very existence of facts. This hasn't been through um, discussions which are engaging in ideas about knowledge production or discussions about the constructed nature of knowledge. Instead, it's been discussions that question whether facts can exist at all, uh, given the potential for partisanship in their production. I think it's interesting to consider whether this is a result of um, the present moment and the present politics. Um, and this insistence that facts do not and cannot exist seems to be the essence of what we're discussing today in this post-truth environment. But a future in which we have no shared facts and therefore no shared meaning has significant implications for our ability to engage with one another at all, as we all know. Um, Alana in my chapter suggests that this problem, um, while indeed concerning, is actually not necessarily new from the perspective of feminist history. Much feminist thought has existed in this disputed territory when it comes to what constitutes facts. From the perspective of activism, public and scholarly debate, feminist perspectives have often been received with incredulity, and this is a pattern that continues today. In their recent edited collection, How Gender Can Transform the Social Sciences, feminist scholars Fiona Jenkins, Marion Sawyer, and Karen Downing have emphasized that in the past, explicit acknowledgement of values sometimes led to judgments that feminist research lacked legitimacy, that it was not objective. In response, feminist researchers identified the unacknowledged values that often caused distortions in scientific and other research. In contrast, feminist research avows its ethical and political commitments in undertaking inquiry that will increase understanding of the nature and source of gender inequalities in order to change them. And so in our chapter, we argue that navigating the waters of what has become known as a post-truth environment has often been at the forefront of feminist activism and feminist scholarship. Yet, if a post-truth environment has gained particular currency since the 1990s, was this problem any less urgent when the conclusions of feminist scholarship had been dismissed in previous decades? And has this new urgency around this question only become paramount now that disciplines that had formerly enjoyed greater authority are feeling increasingly challenged? Feminist history, our chapter suggests, offers important lessons about the temporal, activist, and interdisciplinary context in which the urgent work of establishing a level of public trust in historians and historical knowledge must be established in these urgent times. I'll hand over to Alana now. Thanks, Anna, and thanks, Ben and Marius, for the invitation both to contribute to the chapter and to speak tonight. So, as Anna has explained, our chapter focuses on post-truth politics being very much a continuation of the type of politics that feminists and feminist historians have encountered previously. But if the post-truth environment is merely a continuation or exacerbation of an existing distrust of expertise compared to appeals to commonly received wisdom and things that are felt to be true, how can historians, and in particular feminist historians, adjust their methods and ways of working to meet the challenges of this context? Well, firstly, in this environment, um, many aspects of existing historical methods and practice are more important than ever. Rigorous contextualization of events, resistance of um, short-term thinking, presentism or positivistic interpretations, and attention to gaps and silences in sources. However, embracing new or revived approaches also perhaps offers a way of strengthening the arsenal with which we are able to counter post-truth interpretations of the past. In particular, in the concluding section of our chapter, we examine the role that quantitative, data-driven and digital approaches to feminist and uh, gender history might offer up um, new ways of um, thinking and working. Um, the challenges that these 
um, approaches present, the ways they have invigorated the field to date, and the role that they could play in future scholarship. And the power of such approaches is not necessarily just in their appeal to a more social scientific um, method, but also I think in the opportunities they offer to uncover and present the sort of effectively powerful narratives um, to you know, reference back to you know, Frank's comments about the role of emotions um, to uh, present um, powerful narratives and important narratives about power to global publics um, and you know, increase public engagement in history. This is something I think that's increasingly important in an age of both incredible information and misinformation, um, but most importantly in the midst of what's um, very much a, a rise of a sort of self-informing community. Um, so I guess to end on a slightly more positive note, Anna began with a mention of her experiences with uh, today's university students and I thought it was fitting to end with the observation that something that has really encouraged me in the past few years in the midst of what's um, been very troubled times in the world has been encountering a new generation of students who I think are arriving at university classrooms actually more critically aware, more engaged in what's going on around them and perhaps as a result um, often more receptive to feminist methodologies. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Alana and Anna. And uh, finally, we have uh, Yedre Cherup. And uh, I'm so delighted Yedre can be here because uh, this book has such a strong Polish connection. We have a, a Polish editor, five Polish authors, and it really was born uh, at a symposium in, in Poland. So um, I'm thrilled uh, uh, Yedre can be here. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's 8 a.m. in Warsaw, so it was also uh, a bit of a challenge to, to join this meeting. But um, yeah, I would, uh, my, my chapter is called Post-Truth as a Crisis of Trust. Um, I, won't, I would not give you the summary of my chapter here so that you don't call me a spoiler, but rather I'd give you some glimpses of my, of my perspective on what the post-truth reality brings and actually means practically. Um, of course, you're welcome to look into the text for, for more. Uh, first of all, no matter the theoretical considerations, it brings very concrete consequences that transform our lives and our worlds that are most, mostly negative and also very difficult to overcome. Uh, the first of the first one and the, 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 the most fundamental one, I guess, is how we, let me generalize, let me generalize we, the online people, uh, communicate with one another. Carl Gustav Jung compared the human to human encounter as a, to, to, to a chemical reaction that leaves both sides transformed. And we are simply losing this very dimension every day. Uh, with our heads fed with, wet, fed with constant confirmations and affirmations from our filter bubbles, we are losing the very ability and the willingness to confront our views with anything different. And this is one manifestation of the crisis of trust, obviously. Trust on a very human person-to-person -person level. Then there is a false self-trust in one's own abilities or superpowers in research. Uh, as a layperson has now access to unlimited number of sources, publications, or I should rather say written words, uh, he or she would would, would first be very fast in finding confirmations to whatever presumptions she or he has she held. And thus would wonder, hey, if it's so easy, do we really need all those experts? An expert emerges as a suspicious figure, one that stands between you, my fellow, and the alleged truth, or, or, or at least something he wants to believe. An expert is increasingly seen as someone limiting freedom and hiding the truth say magazines like What Doctors Don't Tell You. Uh, we don't need them anymore. They are, they are to be mistrusted by default. I experienced that a lot. Uh, when I was called to conduct a training on intercultural communication for, for the Polish border guard officers, the very first minute, minute when I met my students, you know, one, of them, one of them came up to my table at the dining room and told, are you here to teach us? You know nothing about it. Uh, 
but but then there is also another side of the coin. Uh, I look at the homegrown truth seekers, the, the conspiracy theorists of all kinds, flat earthers, etc. The ones the, the ones who reject expertise by default once once they sniff the nasty smell of the mainstream, the, the, the new dirty word. Uh, I am now being mean, but but only only I, I only do it to highlight how we tend to see them as bad people. Okay, the very distinction between we and them is is, is often not correct, as conspiracy thinking is is a natural phenomenon, and probably most of us would, to some degree, adhere adhere to to, to some aspects of it. But going back to the classical anti-mainstream, anti-expert conspiracy seekers, they mistrust us, the professionals. But there is clearly a gigantic mistrust in their intentions on our side, which is also unfair. They do it all for, for the good cause, believing to be rebels against the unjust system, which is often indeed unjust and corrupted, to make the world better, which is badly needed, and to finally, and finally to bring light to, to others in the Promethean way. This approach is rooted in the very foundation of the Western humanist individualist civilization. In some way, it is rejuvenating it. Okay, it's, it's, it's actually not due to methodolog methodological traps they pushed themselves into, and due to their lack of trust in the heritage of, of the giants of science that, uh, that were be be before them. Uh, but still, we shouldn't treat the flat earthers as lost for, society, for the society, as enemies, constant threats, but look for ways of, of overcoming the, this mutual mistrust. And it's, it's best to do so by pointing to some solid common ground. Curiosity, drive to ask questions, the desire to improve things, to make the world better. Let me stop with this little provocation here. Thank you. Oh, thanks. thanks so much, uh, Yedre. Um, and uh, I'll, let me just quickly say as well, uh, the book is uh, quite expensive, uh, but there is a 20% discount if you use a code FLR40. Uh, and so uh, perhaps you can uh, request it for your library. Um, and we just have one question, but we only have eight minutes as well. And with the number of panelists, that'll probably be plenty. And I think it's set to automatically stop after five minutes after or something like that. Uh, but uh, Amy asks, uh, uh, what do the authors think the role of academics is in combating misleading information online, especially fake news and things like that on social media, which um, you'd think I'd have a strong opinion on by now, but I sort of keep um, Reevaluating, uh, I certainly don't think any of us have an obligation to, uh, you know, sit around arguing with trolls on Twitter or Facebook all day, and I don't think it's a productive use of our time anyway. But I suppose I would just remind, especially professional historians, that, um, you know, we tend to be quite a humble bunch, I think, overall, and tend to not want to big note ourselves, but I think it's still true that there's a certain level of currency, um, just socially speaking, of if you say I'm Dr. So-and-so from such and such university, and if it says on your Twitter account that you're a, you know, a professor here or a lecturer there or, a, um, or an academic, I, I think it does add a certain gravitas. So um, while I certainly wouldn't say spend all your time arguing with people online, I think it does make a difference. Um, and if you do uh, correct the, the record sometimes, and if you do at least post accurate history in a way that can be easily shared. So that would be my response. Uh, do any other panelists have a view on social media? Yeah, Andre. Yeah, I think perhaps one of the important points to kind of to build on what you're saying about the role um, you know, historians and academics on social media um, is not so much, uh, you know, spend your whole day uh, fighting trolls or whatever, uh, is often the simple presence of being on social media, you know, sharing your interests, your research, your everyday life, and just being a real person. I think some of the mistrust of experts is who is this 
random person coming in to tell me what's what and seeing them as a sort of, you know, aloof uh, sort of person who is completely out of touch with the real world, whatever that might be. Um, and simply by having that sort of, you know, social media profile is a good modern way to actually appear as, hey, here you are as a fully rounded person who is part of the same society society with you no know, wide interests and that you're not just you know an aloof person coming in trying to dictate your view oh, anyone else got a social media policy yeah 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 Dre. well it's not really a social media policy as such but it is a well an academic uh, the way of of you know uh taking a taking taking a role in, in all this process as an academician. So I, I designed and, and I, since, since like five years, I'm, I'm conducting a, a seminar called, called Post-Truth, uh, Fake News and, and the Politics of Information in 21st Century, which is uh, in which like every week we are, we are sitting there with, my, with students and uh, analyzing, you know, the the new, the current manifestations of the of the, of the post truth or current you know social media controversies, um, so that's, I mean, uh, you know, I, I managed to attract three universities at, at this point to 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 include this course into their into their curricula, and but I believe the 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 the, the, the only you know meaningful the meaningful change would be that once this thing becomes a standard in, in, in teaching, in high school teaching and in the university teaching. Because I mean, the, the, the only moment where we as the, you know, the global society become, become resilient to, to the post-truth influence is that once, you know, once we are an educated audience, I mean, we are prepared to, to actually confront all those, all, those, all those phenomena as audiences there's also a huge responsibility and work to do on the audience side. And I mean, as soon as audience is, 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 is prepared to, to, to confront this, this, this weird world, then there is a chance to, to you know, for a change. Uh, so yeah, contributing to, to prepare the audience to, to, to better navigate in this chaos is, is, is my little contribution. Oh, do, um, do any of the other panelists um, want to respond? Uh, yeah, if, if Anna doesn't mind, I might um, jump in and sort of answer for both of us. Um, so Anna and I actually um, joint blog editors of um, VEDA for the Australian Women's History Network and um, as a result are on Twitter, not just as ourselves, um, but as the sort of Australian Women's History Network uh, Twitter handle um, and, uh, you know, see a fair number of uh, sort of trolling comments come through on different um, blogs and um, things that, uh, historical blogs that get posted um, on the Australian Women's History Network uh, site and have sort of, you know, adopt a, adopted a don't uh, interact um, policy in relation uh, to that as the only way to sort of preserve uh, sanity in that situation. So I sort of agree with the don't interact in, in that situation. Um, but I do think that historians very much have an obligation um, to make their work public and publicly accessible and go out of their way to um, provide uh, a counter to the sort of misinformation um, as much as possible by blogging, um, by making their publications um, freely open access where possible um, and um, by, you know, engaging in writing for media and um, other ways of sort of getting our work out there to counter that sort of ideas. Great. Thanks, uh, Alana. Uh, got, uh, one more minute. Uh, Frank, you're a prolific tweeter. Do you have any uh, conscious, uh, conscious policy that you adhere to? Do you see it as providing a public good or is it just, just, well, just having fun? You know, I just noticed Bill had his hand up, actually. Um, I was just going to say, as a dean, I get lots of inquiries on a daily basis from the press to say, 
we've had this comment, blah, blah, blah. We've got some expert that would like to reply and I try my best to make sure that we do do a reply because I feel it is our obligation to make sure we do get the truth out there because that's our job to make sure the truth is known, whether it's from history, whether it's medical facts, whether it's anti-vaxxers, whether it's whatever it's going to be. The truth has to become forefront in our work that we do on a daily basis. So I would encourage every one of you. I don't, I don't believe in Twitter because I don't want to be trolled. I'm scared of Twitter, to be quite honest. <laughs> But any other format, such as recognisable formats like recognisable agencies like ABC, certain television networks, et cetera, certain newspapers, are very viable to be, contribute to, to get that truth out there to the general public as much as possible. Without that, we don't have a voice. We don't have the same. We need to have a voice and we continue to have a voice. We must have a voice. That is our future. Without that, we have no voice at all and we are no longer a university. We need to have that voice and we have to have it strong. Well, well said, Bill. Um... Well, we've, we've just gone one past six, so I think on that um, very good note, perhaps we'll uh, call it to an end. I raise a hawkey to you all uh, one final time, and, uh, and thank you so much uh, uh, for your participation. Thanks all.